hey good evening how y'all doing over there on the west coast uh i am michael burns and i'm here in uh the twin cities in minnesota and i'm uh, grateful to be back with uh some of you all uh we've been doing a series of midweeks and i know for a number of you this is the first time you're joining in on the series and so um it is a series and i'll try to recap uh, a little bit here but i think uh, hopefully you'll be able to, you know, this will be a freestanding lesson in itself too. So I, I don't think you'll be completely lost, but um, just as a little uh, review, we've, we've looked at really kind of four pillars of cultural humility. And one is understanding our purpose in God as image bearers. And that means that we're really made as human beings to reflect God's will and his calling for us, uh, both corporately as, as a people and individually, that it really becomes about us reflecting God's will and how he made us to do that in special ways. And uh, I, I know for me that's it's ironic because, um, you know, a lot of times God will call us out of what we would prefer to do uh, to reflect his will in specific ways. And so... Uh, me, for example, I, I by nature, and, and I'm not overselling this, I'm, I'm actually very um, naturally kind of shy and introverted. And I, I don't necessarily, in fact, I hate being uh, the center of attention or spotlight or speaking in front of people or even being known by people, honestly, is not my favorite thing. And so God called me to, you know, the exact opposite of all of that. And, um, and so here I am with you all, but that's because I've taken up the task of being God's image bearer rather than what I want to do. Then he's given us all the mission of gathering the nations. And we looked at what that means, that our mission is not just to make disciples, that the Bible is very clear that the mission going back from Abraham on through to Jesus and beyond is the mission to gather the nations, to do what the world can't do and display the wisdom of God as he brings all the people groups back together. Um, and, and then he's given us a task. We have a part of that, and that is a task, uh, as Paul defines it in 1 Corinthians 9 most clearly, to be all things to all people. If we don't take up that part of cultural inclusion and that aspect of love, then the mission can and will fall apart because God does put that responsibility on us. He'll move on and use other people. If we refuse to be culturally humble and be all things to all people, um, which is demanded if you're going to be a diverse group. You're going to have many cultures, and you're going to have to participate with all of these cultures. And then last week, we looked at the covering of love, and the, the true challenge of love is loving our brothers and sisters, loving the world, and then being called the love enemies, those who may set themselves up against everything we are and love and hold dear and believe, and, and the challenge of, of that, really, that if if you see somebody that you just don't like, can't stand, even hate, the gospel says, good, now you know who to love. And that's, that's the challenge of following Jesus. Uh, and I want to look at today specifically the idea uh, of cultural humility and focus in on that a little more. Um, and maybe you can make your way over to a very familiar passage, I think, for most of us, Philippians chapter 2. But as you go over to Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> I think it helps to understand a little bit of the cultural background of that passage. Um, Paul is writing the church in Philippi, which is a town that is um, founded by former Roman soldiers. And one of the things that former Roman soldiers would often do is they would go out into far reaches of the Roman Empire and they would develop and found new towns. And so there, Caesar didn't want a bunch of former soldiers roaming around Rome with nothing to do because that's how rebellions get started. So he would send them out to the far reaches of the empire and say, go show the people out there what it looks like to be Roman, to live the Roman way. And so Philippi was very Roman in its culture, as were many of the cities uh, that we know of as New Testament churches, Corinth and so on. And the Roman culture, 
was uniquely aimed at the idea of honor. And honor, what they meant by honor was that you would gain esteem and status in the eyes of others. And it was expected in the Roman culture that you would do whatever you could, you would use whatever means necessary to advance your own status, to make yourself look greater in the eyes of others, to get more praise, and to move up the ladder. And there was six specific categories of status in the Roman culture. There was slave, freedman, freeborn, um, decurion, equestrian, and senator. And you would try to move up, and the higher up you were, the more freedom that you had to do what you wanted, and the more that you could tell other people what to do, and the more praise and honor and esteem you got. And they would work their whole lives, take advantage of every opportunity, step on others to, to move up the ladder, to get more, they, they would bribe people to get better jobs and more and more job titles that they could put on their tombstones just so they could even look impressive after they died. And so they would, they considered things like humility in the Roman word, world. We have to understand this when we read the New Testament. The Romans considered humility a weakness. It was not a virtue. It was something that slaves had because you had no freedom. You had no honor and so therefore you had no choice but to be humble or obedient or whatever so those were considered weaknesses not high values and yet the church comes in preaching something very very different and so this is the kind of the backdrop i could say a lot more but i think that gives us an idea and we'll see how countercultural philippians actually is as he writes the church in philippi and I'm going to pick up in verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Again, this is written to a culture where you did everything out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. And it wasn't considered bad. It was considered normal and good and right to do that. Do nothing, he says. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God. So he's the highest status. He's higher than Senator or even Caesar. And there was a problem in the ancient world with identity theft, but it was pretending to be of a class higher than you were. Rather, you know, no one would pretend to be lower. And that kind of identity theft in the Roman world was so dangerous to their culture that it was actually a crime punishable by death. So he says, here you have the person whose very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And he goes on and says, he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So he took on the most shame possible for the benefit of others. And Paul says, this is, this is 101 of Christianity. This is where we start. This is not the master's level course. Taking on, being willing to take on shame, being willing to uh, advance others, put their interests ahead of your own, not worry about your own status, not worry about your own opinions all the time or airing your own thoughts, but putting the interests of others ahead of your own, Paul says, is this is where we start. This is how we become like Jesus. This is cultural humility. So this is another way that Paul is really expressing what he expresses in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 27, where he says, Although I am free, I make myself a slave to everyone so that I might win as many as possible. And he goes out and says to the Jews, I become like the Jews. To the, the, those not under the law, I become like them. To the underprivileged, I become like them. Whatever group it is, whatever culture it is, I adapt myself. I put their interests ahead of my own. And I believe if, if they would have had words in usage at the time like empathy, uh, Paul would have used that word. I, I am empathetic towards other people. I am humble towards their culture. I learn it. I don't need to counteract 
uh, their experiences or their culture all the time or exalt myself. If we're insistent on doing that, then we're going to be, uh, th then we better accept the reality that a diverse church is not going to be for us because that will break it down. Paul is giving the formula here and he says it's to be like Christ, to put one another first. Um, not thinking we know what's best all the time, not operating under a paternalism of, well, let me tell you how you should think or how you should approach this or what you should watch out for. I'm going to love you. And that means learning your culture. That means me adapting myself. And when we're all doing that, it starts to work. Now, recently, um, Last year in my own life, my, my wife and I, we've been together 25 years. We have two sons. They're 25 and 17. And through most of our married life, we've had people uh, living with us, uh, you know, beyond just the four of us. Uh, almost, probably like 22 or something of those years. We've had disciples. We've had campus brothers. We've had single brothers. We've had uh, single moms and their, you know, kids. And last year, we had a situation where we, where we had seven members of my wife's family living with us. And so I suddenly found myself very much in the cultural minority in my household. And that was a new experience for me, because even though I teach about culture and, you know, dominant culture, non-dominant culture, and I've spent a lot of time, you know, in other countries and on the continent of Africa and so on, I've never experienced that in my own house. We're day to day now. I'm the cultural minority. And so one of the things was during that time, my wife, who's a critical care nurse, was, was still working a lot of hours at the hospital and stuff. And so I was doing a lot of the meal preparation and cooking. And I would make a meal and I would put it on the table and I'd go around and start calling and say, Hey, everybody, supper, supper, supper's ready. And no one would come. And I'm like, what is going on? And it would be like me and my youngest son at the table. My oldest son was at work or something. And they just, they wouldn't come. And I'm sitting there like, how like monstrously rude do you have to be to not come when supper's called? And I, I was like, this is insane. Like, you know, and so we'd eat and we'd finish and I'd leave the food on the counter and then they'd come around later and eat it. So finally, you know, a couple of times my, my wife was there and she would start doing the same thing. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, this is so rude. And she's like, what are you talking about? And so I explained to her my frustration. And she's like, well, what? They're just, they ate at like three o'clock. I'm like, who eats at three o'clock when you know supper is going to be at 530? Like, you don't do that because supper is sacred. And then as we started to talk about it, I realized that I was really operating under this very strong cultural presumption that you have meal at 5.30 and everybody comes. And she started to explain to me, that's not the culture that we grew up in. That, that's just not the way you do it. You make food, you put it on the counter, and people come eat when they're ready and when they want, and they grab the food. And I was like, yeah. And so but they're just operating under, under their normal culture, thinking everything's fine. What they're unaware of is how frustrating it was for me, how isolated I began to feel. And there were other examples than just this one. But I started to feel withdrawn. I started to feel like they don't care what I, what's going on. Like, I always have to adapt to them. They don't, they don't even care about me. And I started literally thinking, like, I could just leave the house and nobody would even care. I'll just go and, you know, visit some other folks who will come when supper's called, and, you know, all of these things. But what that demonstrates is how easy it is to have these cultural misunderstandings and for the dominant group to be unaware of them and not be culturally humble, not be sensitive and being all things to all people and just thinking, what, we're not we're not even being culturally driven. We're just acting the way we normally act. But when you have multiple cultures, you can't just act the way you always act. You can't just presume things. That's the challenge. That's the challenge of being a diverse body.
and I'm not saying one way or the other is, is the better way to do it. I'm just saying there are different ways, and that's the whole point. And so, and that's what 1 Corinthians 9 is all about. But I want to I wanna look here at 1 Corinthians 8, which is just before the passage where Paul, as we've kind of focused on in this series, talks about being all things to all people. And in verse 9, he says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak or the underprivileged. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Now, Paul's talking here about an aspect of culture which we do not have time tonight to unpack. But his point is this. There are different approaches to this topic. And if my way causes my brother or sister to go against their conscience or to struggle or to not understand or to feel unwelcome or unloved, whatever it may, you know, whatever struggle it may cause them, Paul says, I'll give that up. Because my rights, my cultural preferences are not as important as my brother or sister, as loving them. That's not putting their interest first. And it's so easy to do that without even thinking. This was a conflict that came up often in the early church, and we see it throughout the New Testament, where Paul would call on certainly all disciples to be all things to all people but there was always a special call to the dominant group the culture and i don't mean dominant as a one is you know just unlovingly dominating the other i mean the dominant culture the more uh default culture in a church or a group or what have you and oftentimes the dominant culture in a group is simply a reflection of the dominant culture in society and so um, Paul would, will often call in the dominant culture, especially to, you know, be culturally humble and give up some of their rights. In some respects, this is what Jesus is doing with the rich young ruler, where he challenges him to give up all that he has for the poor. Now, we read that and we go, oh, he's challenging him to give up his money. And in one respect, he is. But the other challenge that Jesus is giving that man is, when you give up all your money, you will become like the poor. You are becoming all things to all people. You're going to become one of them. And so you'll learn what it's really like to be like those people. You're going to have to adapt and adopt some of their ways. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to adapt, and he didn't want to give up his money. In Acts 6, we find a conflict between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenic Jews. And the, you know, the Hebraic Jews have the dominance in the church at the time, culturally. And they're called, the, the leaders come in and say, you know what, we're going to give up some of our status and some of our um, authority and power even in the church. And we're going to be all things to all people and be culturally humble and adapt what we do to include and show love to the non-dominant culture. Um, same thing in Acts 15, when you have the Jewish and Gentile uh, cultural conflict. The, the Gentiles are called to adapt some, but the Jews are giving up much, much more. They're being called to adapt much more to the Gentile culture, to be able to, to accept these Gentiles as part of their family. Meant all sorts of things, implications for table fellowship and cleanliness and who they would be around, and all sorts of cultural adaptations they're called to do to be part of this diverse group. Because if the Jews want to hang on to their cultural identity, there will not be a diverse church. There has to then be a Jewish church and a Gentile church. If we are not culturally humble, we cannot be part of a diverse church. It will fracture. 
this is the challenge before us today as a movement. I've been saying for the last several years, anytime I get in front of an audience, look, we are not the first, and I may have said it here in a previous week, we are not the first multiracial church in the history of the United States. We're not. There are multiracial churches going all the way back to the 17th century. But virtually every one of them has fallen apart, and usually within 40 to 50 years, because they got very excited about the mission to gather the nations, but did not put in the work to be culturally humble and be all things to all people. The, if you do the math, we're right around that time period. And so the, that's the challenge before us. Are we going to follow the scriptures and be culturally humble? Or are we going to maintain our rights and our opinions and our thoughts and put, quite frankly, our interests ahead of our brothers and sisters? Um, the challenges go on in the New Testament between dominant and non-dominant groups. Um, Paul challenges the dominant culture in Galatia. Don't you dare try to tell these Gentiles that they have to adapt and adopt your culture in order to be Christians. We decided that back in Acts 15, that Christianity was not going to be culturally based. It's going to adapt to all cultures. It's going to be all things to all people. He turns it around in Rome, and he challenges the Gentiles, who were now trying to dominate the Jews culturally in the Roman church. And so in the letter to the Romans, he argues the opposite way. Paul challenges Peter, who was unwilling to adapt publicly to the Gentile culture. Oh, he would do it when nobody was looking from Jerusalem, but as soon as his boys came around, he backed off. And Paul says, you are not being all things to all people. It's an affront to the gospel, because the gospel is that Jesus is gathering the nations. And if we won't lay down some of these preferences, our, our nationalistic, our political, our cultural preferences, we will fracture the mission to gather the nations. Uh, that's just true. What, one of the important ways that uh, I think we're called to do this, to show cultural humility, is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, we'll turn over there quickly. Uh, and, and I think you know this passage, but let me just read it anyways. Verse 21. Uh, and I'm picking up in the middle of the argument here. But Paul says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now, let me just break in here and say, primarily, when Paul uses the word weak, he doesn't, don't think of like, oh, this is a spiritually shaky person who's about to fall away. That's not how he's using the term. He's using it in a cultural status way, in a societal status. What status do you have? Are, are you privileged or are you, you know, in, in higher status or are you lower status and weaker? So think of unprivileged or dishonored when you re see that word weak, and you'll see how it works in this passage. So those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. That was not the way in society, but he says that's how they operate out there. With stat people of status are more important. People of lower status are nothing. But in the body, we're not playing that game. He says in the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Well, our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. What is he saying here? He's saying, look, people of Corinth, you know what your culture looks like outside of the church. You know that there's these six levels of status. You know that people will do whatever they can to be treated with honor with other people. And those lower on the scale are treated like dirt and they're marginalized and they're oppressed and they don't have the same opportunities. Uh, they're not given respect. They're not treated like human beings. They don't have 
the same uh, access to education, to you know, uh, economic opportunities, uh, to uh, the opportunities of society in general. Um, their culture is not considered. Nobody would put their interests first or even consider their interests. That's what the world looks like. And if we just maintain the status quo, if we just come into the church and act how we normally act, then all those divisions and inequities of the culture are going to follow us right into the church. They're going to stay the same. You're going to have rich and poor. You're going to have honorable and dishonorable. You're going to have those with privilege and those without. And he says, we're not playing that game. And this is not about favoritism. This is about living out the gospel. It is about, and you know, in Philippians 2, right after he says all that about we're going to act like Jesus does in the world and think like Jesus does and put the interests of one another first, he then says in verse 12, now work out that salvation with fear and trembling. Live it out. You better take this seriously. And so this is what he's talking about. We need to look at society and say, what are the inequities? And are we simply mirroring them in the church? Are we mirroring cultural dominance? Are we mirroring uh, a disdain for the unprivileged? Are we mirroring the same levels of segregation and you know unequal access to things that society has? It is, he says, it's on the church to make sure that we don't allow that. We treat those that are underprivileged out in society with special honor. We look at the non-dominant cultures and we, we want them to express themselves. We want them to be lifted up in the church. Those that are presentable, he says, need no special honor in the church. They already have it. And so, yes, we will treat people differently in the church so that there is true equity in the church. That's what cultural humility looks like. But what allows us to maintain the focus on that? Because that's very difficult. And I want to look at this last passage uh, before we end. Our, our time is fleeting rapidly here. But in Colossians chapter 3, he says, Since then, this is verse 1, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So what are our eyes focused on? Is it on our rights? Is it what's fair? Because, you know, it's really important to understand that things like loving your enemies, cultural humility, putting the interests of others first, you know, giving greater honor to the less honorable, those things are not fair. Let that sink in for a minute. But what's more unfair than the cross? We talked about that last week. There's nothing more unfair than the cross. And he says, keep your eyes set on Christ. This is how we're going to be called to live. We're going to strive for equity by bringing unfairness onto ourselves, by putting the interests of others first, by picking up our cross. And we've got to keep our eyes focused on that, on the things above, the higher things, rather than just the equity of the world. Set your minds, he says, on these things above, not on earthly things. That doesn't mean we just pretend like there's nothing on the earth or none of that matters or we're just waiting to float off to heaven one day. No, he says, what drives us is the values of heaven. We are living out the values of God's future, not by the values of the world. For you died. Remember that? You signed up to die. That's what you did at your baptism. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. That is our motivation. That's what we're striving for. Um, that's what will keep us driving towards cultural humility is to take our eyes off of ourselves to even take our eyes off of others and to take put our eyes on Jesus Christ and follow his example and mindset. Um, amen. I, was, I had 30 minutes for the lesson. That's 29 minutes and 54 seconds. And we're going to go to the Q&A.
Wow, great job. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Very powerful. Uh, loved watching the chat, just seeing uh, you're impacting people in the spirit. Really appreciate it. So again, if anyone uh, would like to ask a question, that we're asking that you just send it to me through the private chat. And uh, a couple of them I want to pick right now. Um, really powerful stuff. So let's start with uh, my old friends, Dave and Diane Ford. If you guys want to ask your question, I think it's uh, relevant. And uh, see what Michael has to say about that. Eric, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, I've been you know, reading about your, uh, the importance of the uh, church being culturally diverse of course. And um, I believe that we are. Um, but when it comes down to the small groups, now how important it is, is it for the small groups to also be culturally diverse? Because because sometimes we want to set it up by life stage or by language, like uh, we have a Korean small group because some of them don't know English that well or so on. So uh, how important is it, you know, going down uh, at that level? Yeah, uh, I, I think it, that that can be different for each church and, you know, where they're at, what they're trying to accomplish, what their situation is. Uh, I can tell you one example um, where we went into a church a few years ago and they had just went to very regionally based small groups, uh, ge geographically based. And it was causing real problems in the church and they couldn't figure out why. And there was some racial issues popping up. And what it turns out is that in going to such a strict geographical um, setup without really, I think, putting in that work of 1 Corinthians 12 of, you know, hey, how do we balance out some of the inequities of the world? They, they lived in a very segregated town. And so what it meant was they had most of their family groups now were racially segregated. And that was really hurting the, uh, the hearts and the feelings of, of many of the disciples of color. So we, you know, challenge and help them to see that maybe that, although there were some benefits to that from one angle, that it was actually hurting the church from another angle. So I think there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, but probably even beyond that is, um, is really, I think, for each disciple to look and say, who's in my life? Who's at our table on a regular basis? Um, you know, I, I can be in a diverse church and be fooled a little bit by, oh, I have great friends and all that. But on a day to day, in and out, heart challenge, um, you know, heart level rather, you know, who is in my life? Are my are my true friends diverse? And I think that is super important. And, and a lot of disciples, when you really start probing in, they'll be like, man, outside of church events, it may have been a long time since I've had a disciple of another culture or color uh, over to my house or really intertwined in my life. So uh, it's difficult to answer the small group question because there may be a whole a lot of other factors going on. Um, uh, I do think you can maybe sometimes over engineer diversity a little bit, but I think it's you have to be intentional about it. But I think more importantly is in our own lives. Are, are we really doing that and taking up that call? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Awesome. Thank you, Diane and Dave. Okay, uh, Todd and Yolanda, uh, you had a, you know, a, a question I think uh, brings up some questions a lot of other people might have had. Uh, go ahead and ask that, Todd and Yolanda. And I'll spotlight you. Thanks. Sorry, our dog just barked, so my wife had to go. <laughs> uh, so uh, my question has to do with, with some of the, the conversations that we're getting in and some of the books we're reading and things we're seeing. But there's a term that's, uh, that's really used quite frequently on, uh, in, in the media and in uh, publications, and it's the, the term racist. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you're white, you're racist. If you're, there was a book called White Fragility that talks about this, I understand. And and so for me, my understanding of racism is a hatred towards another, another group, another race, another uh, ethnicity, uh, or whatever uh, categorization of a group. And as a white man, uh, and as a disciple, I obviously work very hard not to hate anyone. 
Uh, but am I mistaken? Am I is or is this a, the wrong term? And should it maybe maybe we we shouldn't be using the word racism, but maybe something else? I'm just trying to understand it. Yeah. More. No, I, that's something when I do workshops, that's one of the things I, I really focus in on is the, the language, um, because I think it's sloppy. And, and the example I would use in our culture is, look how we've destroyed the word love. I mean, that means nothing anymore. I love my wife. I love Chipotle. I love my dog. How, how can I use the same word for all of those things? It, you know, it, it, it almost means nothing anymore. And so language needs to be precise. And the world is very imprecise with it. And we should expect that. From the time of Genesis 11, where God separated the nations because of our rebellion, he came to Abraham then and said, we talked about this in the, in the lesson a couple of weeks ago, and said, I'm going to gather the nations. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who's going to do it. The world is unable to truly bring the nations together. So I think we've got to be very wary about following and copying the world. Um, and the, so the whole idea of unity and diversity and caring for the marginalized and the oppressed, the world has stolen that, hijacked that from Jesus anyways. Nobody in the world was talking about that before Jesus. So let's not think we're following the world by paying attention to these things, but let's not follow their solutions. And so one of the realities is that the white Western European rooted culture tends to be very individualist and most cu cultures of color tend to be collectivist. And so that plays into something. The, the way the culture uses the word racism is, is very sloppy and it sort of goes all over the place. But individualists tend to hear the word racism and think that means I don't like somebody because of the color of their skin. That's what racism is. Um, and so it's an individual thing. And we've built these cultural constructs where um, the individual is the autonomous self. I have responsibility. I can make things happen through my own effort, through my own hard work, through my own responsibility. I'm anti-structural as an individualist worldview, meaning there can't be a structure or system bigger than the individual. For the collectivist, the, from collectivist cultures, they see the world differently. They think communally. They think of groups. They see the interrelatedness and the structure and the system. So when they talk about uh, racism and when sociologists use the term racism, uh, if they're using it precisely, and, and the way I encourage disciples to use it is to refer to a system of oppression, a, a larger system that doesn't necessarily need prejudiced people anymore to fuel it. It was set in place a long time ago. It's continued, um, you know, it didn't just end with slavery in 1865. The 13th Amendment is passed, which says slavery is outlawed unless you're a prisoner then you can be put back in slavery and, and enslaved. And so this, many of the states immediately passed laws that made everything from, you know, walking down the wrong street to not having a job, a crime. And then they just rounded people up and put them right back into slavery. Uh, they gave away millions of acres of land to only white folks in the 19th century, denied it to people of color. Um, they continue redlining, de denying people housing loans and equal housing on through well into the 20th century. You have, um, you know, suburbs were built expressly with rules written in them so that they would be white only, which took all the jobs out of the inner cities, which created an economic hole. The, the war on drugs, even though... Uh, statistics showed that whites and blacks used and sold drugs at equal levels. The war on drugs immediately went to neighborhoods of color rather than white neighborhoods and gutted those neighborhoods. And you have welfare policies that sort of ripped apart the family and all of these things that are part of sort of the system that creates an unequal playing field. That's racism, I think. That's how we should use that term. And so it's a system of power. I would advocate for, if we're going to be consistent, let's not even call people racist uh, at all. Um, let, let's, not, let's not do that because it, it starts to be sloppy. Um, anybody can be 
prejudiced, biased, discriminatory, um, you know, bigoted, you name it. But we'll, we'll try to, uh, I'm encouraging us as disciples is to use the word racism for that system. Because here's what happens. Here's the problem. When an individualist hears racism, they think it's an individual who doesn't like somebody because of the color of their skin. A collectivist will say, man, we still have problems with racism. We've got to deal with in this society. The individualist will say, what are you talking about? It's not my responsibility. Oh, I'm an individualist. I can only be responsible for myself. I don't dislike people because of the color of their skin. So please stop talking to me about racism. And then the individualist says, and this is where it can really, uh, you know, the rubber hits the road. The individualist says, because it's an individual problem, the solution is individual, which means it's relational. So the greatest thing in the mind of an individualist culture that I can do to end racism is relational. And so you'll hear statements like, I can't be racist. I have black friends. That drives people of color crazy. What are you talking about? Because they're thinking the system of racism, whether you have black friends or not, does nothing about this system. There's still racism. But for the individualist, they can't process the idea that there's a structure or system bigger than individual, bigger than relational. So in their heart of hearts, they are saying, I am doing everything imaginable to end racism. I have black friends. I have Latino friends. And it gets very frustrating. And without recognizing those dynamics of culture and that we're using language very differently, we're never going to be able to have a productive conversation. Um, and so that's why I think it's a phenomenal question. And it, it, it is important to try to use that language very specifically, or at least if somebody uses the word racist or racism, say, can you define for me exactly what you mean by that? Just so we're on the same page for this conversation. Um, I, I'll stop there. I, I could go on, but you know, I don't want to take up all the time on one question. Wow, that was great. Thank you very much. Super rich. Um, we're getting a lot of questions rolling in. I think um, I, I definitely want to have Roz uh, and Craig Aaron ask the question because a number of them came in about raising up uh, leadership. And uh, why don't you go ahead, Roz? If you want to ask that question, or Craig. Hi, uh, Michael. Thank you for uh, the lesson. I really appreciate that. I was uh, chatting with with Steve, and one of the questions, or the question that I was asking, is, you know, as part of inclusion and diversity, is really representation, right? In positions yeah. of leadership and authority, uh, not just in government, in corporate world, and obviously, the church as well. For us, there's obviously there's a spiritual aspect to it, right? Um, you just don't raise people up because of the color of their skin. But I do believe that, you know, in order for us to be um, inclusive and diverse, part of that is really having a succession plan on, on raising up leaders and elders of people of color. And so my question is two part. First, you know, what are you personally doing right, in, in your church and in your position to be able to raise up people of color, right, uh, within our church. And then as a whole, is the church doing something to mitigate some of the, you know, some of those issues where we're, we're lacking elders of people of color? I've been at cycle for over 20 years. And I think, you know, whenever I look at the stage, you know, whether it's a huge congregation, I, I rarely see elders of people of color. And um, I do feel like that's something that I just wanted to highlight, if that's something that we're doing yep. as a church, or even, like, again, personally, you yourself as a minister. Yeah, so uh, I really appreciate that question. And, uh, you know, I think, um, for one, there, there is the, the global social cultural unity and diversity team. Um, I'm, I'm a part of that team, but this is an issue that they've been addressing and working on for a number of years. Um, some of the guys, Scott Kirkpatrick in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, is the chair of that group. 
Um, and, um, you know, they've been working on it before I was part of the group and, and I'm under those guys, Scott and James Campbell, and I, I'm in submission to those, those guys. And I appreciate their, um, work. I, I think, um, it, it's definitely an issue and I think it's, it's two pronged and, uh, uh, the, the response to it, but I think in, in a lot of ways it's caused by that very dynamic behind 1 Corinthians 12, 21 to 26, which is we mirror the society around us. And so if there is inequity in access and education and opportunity, if we don't take special effort, that will simply be mirrored in the church. And so one of the examples I use, and, and the churches in South Africa, I love them, they're phenomenal churches, and we do a lot of our work in Africa. And a, a year and a half ago, we realized that, you know, we've been working for a number of years. Um, but uh, a year and a half ago, there were still zero teachers in our family of churches on the continent of Africa. And so we've been working to change that. And we appointed a West Africa, East Africa, you know, um, uh, French West Africa, but then it came to South Africa, and a couple of years ago, we realized that the, the guys who were qualified to be teachers were all white. Now, this is in a country that's 89% black. So, uh-oh, how did that happen? Uh, what are we going to do there? Uh, but what it is, is without meaning to, it's a reflection of the apartheid, of the inequity in education and some of those things. So we had to look and say, okay, and I'll cut to the chase here. And, and one of the things that was very noble is the three white brothers said, we will not um, take an appointment until there are brothers of color ready to be appointed teacher. So the first thing we had to do is, is analyze the here and now and say, were there cultural factors? Were we looking at people and excluding them because of a cultural preference that, you know, maybe we were blind to or something and, and, valuing certain elements. And I think sometimes that happens in leadership. You know, you just look and you say, oh, that brother's naturally a leader because his culturally he fits more comfortably with the other leaders. So you, you've got to look at that. You've got to learn to be all things to all people there. Um, what we did in that case was we said, we're not going to appoint somebody a teacher just because of the color of their skin or a non-spiritual reason. But we're going to accelerate their training. We're going to give them the same training, but we're going to really focus on this. I think that's what you see in Acts 6. You had a group being marginalized, and what did they do? They took brothers from that group who were spiritual, who were ready. They trained them. They got them ready, and they put them in positions of uh, authority. And so uh, that's very important. However, that's only the first prong, because then you've got to go back and say, how do we long-term deal with this? And so one of the things we're looking at in the cultural committee is how do we go back? How do we maybe create scholarships? How do we make sure that there's enough, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds being trained up, having educational opportunities, being able to afford to go to seminary if they want and get that kind of training. Um, you know, scholarships, opportunities, those sorts of things that I think as a movement uh, we have to start looking at and, and where we need people who are really wise and creative uh, with uh, money issues and, and things like that to do that sort of thing. The other thing I think is, and this is the last thing I'll say here is just on a practical level, um, it, and it's not just culture or color or whatever, I think there's an age element too. There can be a gap between the generations culturally. Um, and one of the things I would urge, if you're a leader of any level um, and you're, you know, over 40 or whatever, I'm 48, I, I have a mentor um, who is a 25-year-old black uh, brother. Uh, and he, he is my mentor. And he thought I was crazy when I came to him at first and said, will you be my mentor? But I want him to mentor me. Uh, you know, he helps me out with, you know, cultural issues and all that, but especially generational issues. Like I'm trying to reach back to his generation. He's more of an expert than I am. So why would I think just because I'm 48, I know how to connect with 20 year olds better than he does. And so I think just having that 
um, helps you see the world from a different perspective too. And also, and there is mutual, you know, stuff going on. And so it helps raise him up and give him opportunities um, too. So I, I think maybe doing things like that too. And then, you know, being willing to take on um, more of a advisory role and giving opportunities to other people. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this and just say it straight out. There is an issue that we have to be honest about and face in our hearts, that there are a number of white disciples, as well-meaning as they are, who find reasons to have problems when they're led by a disciple of color. And that, you know, we've seen white flight in some of the churches when a leader of color takes over, there's all of a sudden reasons why they need to go to another region or another church. Um, we've got to be honest about those things. The New Testament never tried to cover up their ethnic difficulties and conflicts. We have them. We've got to address them and say, you know, we got to do some, some work and challenge ourselves um, because when someone, of, I don't think it's, oh, I now have a black leader and I don't like the color of their skin. I think it usually has to do with these cultural things. They're doing it culturally different. And all of a sudden it becomes uncomfortable for me and I don't like it. And so that's where we've really got to be culturally humble and be all things to all people, which we haven't always done. It's easy to do it when we're in charge. It's harder to do when somebody else has a position of authority. So those are some of the things we've got to think about. I appreciate the, the response. Like you said, I think the intentionality is, is important for us as a church to kind of explore and really to be intentional of, of how we are going to raise elders and leaders of people of color. It's good stuff. Thank you so much, Michael. Roz, great question. Um, one, you know, people are loving this. Uh, but we do have a couple announcements. I do want to ask one more question. I wanted our, one of our campus students who uh, is part of our uh, Kingdom Inclusion team on the west side. Kenzie had three or four questions, actually. So go ahead, Kenzie, if you want to ask one. And then this will be our last one, guys. We do need to go to the west side after this question is answered. We're going to go to a west side Zoom link for some announcements uh, that we need to have uh, and a special debrief for our group uh, about the survey we're doing. So, Kenzie, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Um, Hello, Mr. Burns. I just had a, a quick question. Uh, yeah. Throughout most of the message, uh, I, it kind of seemed or I kind of got the vibe that you're saying that when a person of the dominant culture uh, goes ahead and honors another culture, he then is doing them a favor. Uh, and in my mind, when I hear something like that, it seems this kind of seems to maintain this cultural hierarchy. Uh, is that what you were attempting to communicate or am I mistaken? No, not, not at all. Um, in fact, um, I'm very critical of that mindset, which we can slip into, you know, and we'll say things like, uh, you know, we need to create a, a, a seat at the table for other people. Well, who said it was my table? I don't get to invite other people. It's all of our table. Um, no, it, it's not a favor at all. It is, it is what is required of us um, from Jesus. Uh, uh, to be part of his kingdom. And I think we all are called to be all things to all people. My emphasis on the dominant culture is that, um, you, you know, we do tend to, the dominant culture does have uh, the, the greater influence and sometimes the, the greater authority. And so I think there is a special call uh, to give that up, uh, not at all in, in the sense of, um, that's the rightful place of that culture or anything like that. Quite the opposite um, is the, I think what the scriptures call us to is when you do have a privilege, you lay it down for the benefit of others. Um, and uh, that's, that's called carrying your cross. And so I, I think that's the, the way um, to equal uh, the, the, the footing or the ground inside the church, because if we, if we're not intentional about that, we will just, as I said, mirror the inequities, uh, of society. Um, uh, so I, you know, I've written a lot more on that. I could probably, I don't know if that kind of answers your question directly there. Um, but, uh, I'm not sure where you went. I, lo I lost you on the screen, but I'm right, I'm right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate the question. And, and 
if I could just uh, um, if I could just mention real quick uh, if if people do want to get more into this, I know you, you know some of you are, are reading the book. I do have a number of books. There's uh, Crossing Line, Culture, Race, and Kingdom, um, All Things to All People, The Power of Cultural Humility, uh, the book that some of you are reading, A Crown That Will Last, the devotional. And then this uh, last week, it just came out with um, Escaping the Beast, Politics, Allegiance, and Kingdom. Uh, you can get those at michaelburnsteachingministry.com um, or Amazon, you know, things like that. And then um, I do also have a podcast where we go through and talk about a lot of these issues uh, in a much uh, longer format. And I have a lot of guests and that kind of stuff. And it's called the All Things to All People podcast with Michael Byrne. So if you're interested in that, you can go there and, and get more um, as well.